Sağol. So we are live, waiting for people to join. Yeah, I can see some people starting to join. 621, yeah, lots of uh, quickly, people are quickly connecting. Oh. So we must, hi. We must have tens of people out there. Yeah. yeah. So hi, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar with, uh, with me, Ugo Che, and my guest for today, uh, the passionate photographer Steve Simon, who is uh, connecting with us from New York City. Hi, Steve. Hello, everybody. Uh, it doesn't look too New York City, my background. Uh, we just moved, so we're kind of in transit, but figured a clean background at least would be good. It, it works well with uh, with video transmission, nothing distracting. Yeah. On your back. Oppositionally, though, I think maybe I'm too centered, but I'm not worried. It's great. No rule of thirds. Okay, just a little banter, uh, just to leave people the time to people who are joining at the last minute to to actually join. Uh, and while we are waiting, just a couple more minutes, I would like to invite everyone, uh, if you're watching this on my website page, uh, at ucphoto.me, beneath the video, there's a little line that says that if you have question, you can join the live chat and click here. This uh, opens the video on the, the YouTube page because we are on YouTube live. And uh, on the right-hand side, there is, um, oh, I see people are already, where is that? Oh, people are already uh, putting messages there. And I wanted to ask, uh, uh, where are you from? I don't even need, even need to ask because yeah, people are already good. typing that. Yeah. I see we have uh, uh, Joanne from Chicago and Tazzy Devil 1011 from Toronto, Ontario. Uh, Kit from Vancouver, Severin from Germany, Gilly. Hi, Gilly. We met in uh, in Menton uh, last week from uh, Menton, France. And others, the thing here doesn't really scroll. I don't know why. <laughs> Let's see if I can make this scrolling and read all of the other things. No, it's not scrolling. Oh, okay. Okay, whatever. So. There are people joining, and if I can make that work, I will be able to uh, read your questions. So just start typing them in the live chat, and we'll try to answer as many as possible. So uh, let's jump right to, into the, the meat of this webinar. Um, it's going to be quite short because uh, uh, due to some unforeseen circumstances, uh, Steve will only be with us for a little less than one hour. Uh, Steve, I know you are leaving for Cuba this weekend, so uh, you had to, to prepare some things at the last minute, right? Yes, yes we're doing another workshop in Cuba. I love going to Havana. It's, it's just a great uh, place to photograph. Have you been there, uh, Hugo? I haven't been there yet. No, it's, no, it's got to be on your list. You should come because we have a couple of spaces open. Uh, we're leaving uh, the workshops December 3rd to 9th next week, so if any last-minute people are there, they could uh, get a hold of me or go to the photoeducate.com uh, website and check it out, look for the Havana workshop. But uh, yeah, I'm going to leave, uh, you know, at 1.45, looks like today. And um, I'll try and get in as, as much stuff. We'll keep it kind of businesslike and we'll get to the meet, as you say, uh, shortly. And we'll have uh, another, we decided to do another uh, webinar after this one. Uh, it will be uh, on December 13th, that's a Thursday, and it will be at 12 p.m. noon Eastern, that is 1 a.m. Pacific or 5 p.m. Greenwich, uh, just to give you an idea. But everyone who is who has signed up for this will get an uh, official announcement with the link, and we will have more time to, to discuss the topics of today. But again, I don't want to uh, spend a lot of time just doing a little idle chit chat. Let's go right into uh, the meat of this. So we're going to talk today about street photography. Uh, we're going to do a very a bit of an introductory webinar about street photography for people who either are familiar with it or are not familiar with the genre. 
but uh, in any case, I hope this will be interesting for and useful for everyone. So first of all, I would like to start off and ask you a question. How do you define street photography? Because I've heard lots of people giving very different definitions. So what is street photography for you? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, as human beings, as photographers, we like to, to have labels and uh, street photography um, is a somewhat of a general one. I mean, for me personally, the street can be anywhere. It doesn't have to be a physical street. It could be sort of a dirt road uh, in a small village. Um, but coming from a journalistic background, it really means uh, being out in the world and capturing life uh, kind of as it happens, as you encounter it. Sometimes it's a candid moment. Sometimes it's an engagement with someone that you meet that you would uh, like to get their photograph. And um, uh, so uh, I, I keep the umbrella of street photography kind of uh, wide open because ultimately um, the best street photographs like the best landscape or any kind of photographs, when the viewer sees it, they're going to feel something. They're going to, uh, it's going to evoke some sort of an emotional response. And I think that's what some of the best art does. And photography is, is right in there, whether it's street or any other kind of genre of photography. Uh, to me, at least, on the surface, uh, street photography sounds easy. I mean, it's not technically difficult because uh, subjects are ready available, typically on the street. Uh, precise composition, even exposure and focus sometimes are not required. I mean, I see a lot of uh, street photos that are blurry just because the subject is moving and so on. But in general, that's not considered a defect. So it's uh, maybe deceptively easy. Uh, and this has led, in my view, a number of people to take random photos on the street and say they do street photography. But I think street photography has a deeper meaning, um, don't you think? Yeah, I agree. I, I think uh, to think that I mean, I think it's accessible because we all can leave our private, the privacy of our home, apartment, wherever we are, and go out into the world, and we have the possibility to photograph. Um, so, from an accessibility standard, um, it's easy to access. Uh, as a landscape photographer, you got to seek out those vistas and those beautiful places at specific times. I think street is a little bit more open. Um, light, of course, is important in all photography. But in street, it's maybe a little less important, um, mainly because sometimes you know the harsh or the traditionally photographable uh, golden light is 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 fantastic. But um, the street, uh, you know, we have artificial light, we've got night light, we've got harsh light, which can really kind of um, elevate a street photograph if it's a harsh scene that you're photographing. So it's accessible, but I would argue it's the opposite to you know what your hypothesis was. I know you don't believe that it's easy, um, but it's actually arguably the most difficult genre because things are completely out of our control on the street, generally speaking. Um, I tend to, and a lot of street photographers tend to work with a wider lens because I think that a physical proximity to your subject yields a communication that is different when you're sort of across the street with a telephoto lens. It can still be a powerful mm -hmm. capture with a telephoto lens from afar. But when you're physically close to your subject, there is a kind of three-dimensionality that is being um, communicated that you can't really get with a telephoto lens. And because you are close, it opens you up. It makes it kind of uh, difficult in a way because uh, you're, you're out there, you're vulnerable, people see what you're doing. You don't necessarily, we'll talk about permission and so on later, but um, you're exposed, so to speak. So um, right. it really requires you to get out of your comfort zone. It doesn't mean you have to be an aggressive person or an extrovert. It just means that you have to bungee jump and get out there and feel what it's like to be in the situation up close with your camera and the kind of exhilaration of taking a photo in front in the street that you really like. Uh, you may, sorry. Uh, let me just uh, give a little bit of a PA here. I, I read from the chat that some people are having problems with an echo. And this is due to the fact that you, for those people probably have clicked on the link to open the YouTube uh, window while the video is still playing on the other window, so they, it's playing twice. Maybe that's the issue, so I would just 
close the other tab or window or stop the the video there that should fix the issue because I don't think I checked. I don't think we are generating any echo. Uh, but if anyone has uh, problems with uh, with the audio here, uh, there would be a recording available. So, and I'm pretty sure that's clean. So, okay. Um, back to back to our conversation. Um, you, you mentioned lenses. You mentioned getting close. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about equipment, about gear. Sure. Uh, what's your uh, go-to kit for shooting on the streets? What's your what well, kind of camera yeah, lenses do you use? What's your yeah, approach? Yeah. I mean, I'm a Nikon guy, so I use uh, Nikon uh, equipment. But And lately, I've been getting into the mirrorless, and we can talk a little bit about that, the advantage of having a smaller camera, uh, quieter camera. But I do tend to like the uh, wider lenses for the reason that I mentioned. It's hard to articulate what you get with, let's say a 35 millimeter focal length versus you know 135 millimeter focal length. But you know it when you see it and when you use it properly, it can be a very powerful way to shoot. I think personally, my favorite focal length is 35 millimeter. I find that uh, I'm able to tell enough of the story mm -hmm. on the streets with my 35, move in close and get a very kind of impactful image with that focal length. The trick is to kind of move in close. I try and stay perpendicular as much as possible to kind of minimize distortion. Um, and it, it's powerful. You know, I, I have used, for instance, a 35 and an 85, and that's probably a, oh, that's a 58, actually, uh, the one that's flashed on the screen now in Harlem. Yeah, I'm just uh, uh, showing some of your photos while you're speaking. I don't yeah. know if they're <laughs> appropriate yeah, to illustrate no, this. But it's actually very um, uh, apropos because, you know, that, that picture was taken with a 58 millimeter. And Interestingly, um, you know, the 50 millimeter was never a focal length I really liked. I liked the 35, it was a little wider, gave me a little more breathing space and allowed me to, um, you know, get in close and tell more of the story. But I ended up um, getting rid of my 85 and not using it very much in, in favor of the 58 because I found that if I'm going to have a little bit more of a, a flattening effect with a longer focal length, the 58 allowed me to be Comfort, uh, uh, comfortably close to my subject uh, in a way that I found um, was a little bit more impactful um, for uh, the pictures that I was taking. The 85 was a little bit far away. Now, of course, if you're a commercial photographer, and of course, a lot of street photographers, if you're a professional, you've got to do other things to pay the rent. And, uh, you know, the 85 is a very flattering lens uh, for people because of that slight compression. But for me on the street, the 58 ended up to, uh, being kind of the magical sort of street portrait lens, if you will. Uh, and sometimes I might have two camera bodies. I'll have a 35 and a 58. Um, but it depends on the situation because, of course, I don't know where everybody is in their webinar or watching the webinar from, but, you know, different places require different tools. Um, you mentioned I'm going to Havana. I find that in Havana, it's an incredible place for a street photographer because the people are very open and of course the the place is very visual and the light is very beautiful because you know the inner city of Havana with the uh, beautiful buildings many of them kind of uh, uh, crumbling but but very photogenic the people are very welcoming and um, uh, because of that there's a lot of balconies um, that are just out of reach of the 35 58 85. So I might bring along a 70 to 200 um, because there are images on the street, from the street, of this sort of balcony culture, if you will. There's a lot of outdoor balconies and the weather is warm. So I'm able to zoom in to get images that I just can't get um, with traditional street focal lengths. So, you know, again, I've, I've had the good fortune of traveling around the world to many places and photograph. And, um, you know, I, we saw a slide, the rhythm of place is different in each place. So ultimately, um, you know, you, you want to come in with your sort of bread and butter. Ultimately, you have to be most comfortable with the equipment that you've got because the street is ever changing. And I know we'll talk about that in terms of the process. You, the camera has to kind of fade away, which means that you have to use it in such a way that you take care of the technical very early on, which frees you up to concentrate on the million other things that are more important out on the street. And that is sort of looking, finding, moving around and you know getting the image that you're hoping to get in focus right shutter speed all that kind of stuff 
Speaking, speaking of focus, uh, I have a I question have a here from uh, Brian, Brian, who wrote, who wrote sorry, sorry, now, now, I, I, see, now I, I hear an echo. Uh-oh. <laughs> let's try again. Maybe it's you, I don't know. Anyway, let's see. Uh, I got this uh, this question from Brian, uh, who said, uh, wanted to ask about zone focusing and other tips for capturing moment quickly without a lot of camera fiddling. So I thought this was a good segue question into your mentioning focus yeah. and focal lengths yeah. and so on. No, it's a great question. I mean, obviously the technical can easily get in the way on the street. So you wanna make sure exposure and so on um, is taken care of. And most of our modern cameras are fantastic in that way. We don't really have to worry about them. We can use them in aperture priority, for example, or shutter priority. I tend to use aperture priority where I can choose my depth of field. Um, and I also use auto ISO with a minimum shutter speed because in my experience, unless you have a fast enough shutter speed to neutralize both my excitement and movement as well as subject movement, often the picture is a little bit blurry and if the blur isn't helping the picture, it's hurting it. So I err on the, the side of sharpness with a fast shutter speed. Focus is the other key. I mean, you could have everything within the photograph, but if the focus is off or just not there, um, that picture ends up being an almost. And, you know, even Cartier-Bresson said, you know, you have to throw away the, the maybes. There are no maybes. There's just the yeses and there's the, the noes. So, um, you know, today's cameras, autofocus can be very fast, but nothing is as fast as that zone focusing that Brian brings up. And, you know, that requires you to set a set aperture and it depends on the focal length of the lens. It might be f8. Um, and you know that everything from, you know, depending where you focus the camera, let's say you say you focus on four feet, everything from, you know, three feet to nine feet will be sharp. You don't have to focus anymore. You can just go in and click and go. And that's what a lot of the great masters of street photography did long before autofocus. And they were able to get the amazing images that they did because they didn't have to fiddle with focus and they were able to move very quickly. Um, the downside, of course, is that sometimes, you know, you have too much depth of field. And because of that, uh, maybe the viewer's eye is distracted or drawn to different parts of the scene that, you know, are not as um, important or as interesting as sort of the main focus of the, the picture. But there are many ways to sort of go about that. You don't even have to look through the viewfinder. You can shoot from the hip. The whole random idea of shooting from the street can be a very fun an interesting exercise to, to sort of feel your way through once you get a sense of, you know, the focal length and the coverage that you're going to get. Mm -hmm. It's like anything, though. You have to practice it a little bit so you know that at a specific aperture. And you, you can look it up online to see the charts to tell you exactly. Some lenses, some of the, of course, the rangefinder Leica lenses will tell you at different apertures how much is going to be in focus with that focal length. But zone focusing can be a powerful way to go, um, particularly the mirrorless cameras are well suited for them. You can use them on a DSLR. In my own experience, because I, I have shot the DSLR most comfortably my whole life, I tend to rely on the amazing autofocus systems that are out there. Um, I also like to sometimes shoot with selective focus, not very much depth of field, to keep the viewer's attention on specific parts of the scene. So. I think it's 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 open, but it's it's definitely exciting to get out there on the street because there's no excuse. There's always subject matter, and once you get a couple of strong images, I think you might be hooked. Uh, you mentioned shooting from the hip. Uh, is that something that you do often? Uh, I find it really hard to do. I mean, it needs a lot of practice, right? Because when I do it, I invariably end in, and cutting up people's heads and stuff like that because yeah. the camera is never <laughs> exactly. oriented like the, the way I, mean, I think it is. You're right. I mean, I think shooting from the hip um, is, I think, a little bit of a shield. I think people need to put themselves out there. And I think if people are a little less comfortable on the street, feel they're invading people's privacy, shooting from the hips, a way to kind of shoot without being noticed. But of course, now, um, with articulating live view screens and you know the new Nikons, and I know other manufacturers allow it too, I can simply touch an area of the screen. It will then focus on that area and take the picture. So it allows me to be very stealthy without really shooting from the hip. I'm 
composing. If you look at you know the great street photographers like Gary Winogrand, and I've talked to a couple of people that have actually been students of his, and he never shot from the hip. He would always frame his picture. He was very fast. And if Hugo Che wanted to be a shoot from the hip guy, you're not having success because you haven't committed to it and practiced it all the time. But if you really wanted to do it, you could learn to do it well. I know that I remember you telling me in Chicago that um, portraits was something you were a little uneasy, street portraits. So you said to yourself, I'm going to shoot, what, a portrait a day for like three years or something? Yeah, yeah. Well, for one year. But <laughs> one year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, uh, I don't practice shooting from the hip often because uh, it's, I, I like to, to, to try to overcome my fears. Sometimes the street photography, especially if it involves uh, people from close up, it's a matter of, of being afraid. I mean, it's a matter of fear. So I don't want to hide behind my fear and just shoot from the hip because I'm not confident of the people's reaction, what they might think of me. Uh, I just wanted to point out from the shooting from the hip idea, there's a friend of mine, a Suichi Hayashi. We do a workshop in Tokyo. And it's an exercise that he does some once in a while, shooting from the hip at different shutter speeds. And it's the whole idea of this kind of arbitrary kind of surprise that you get. And, you know, for me, I'm old and I go back to the film days. And, you know, before digital, you couldn't have that instant access. You had to wait to look at your film or negatives or whatever slides. And that time lapse between, you know, meant that you couldn't really remember everything, which helped you to edit and be a little more objective. But also there was that surprise and excitement that you got it. And, you know, in photography, even with the instant access, I try not to look very much. I turn off my review screen. But when I get an image that, you know, could not be planned and that element of surprise, wow, um, to me, that's really the joy of photography. And, and the street allows for a lot of that happening. Most of the time you fail, but when it happens, it's exciting. So I said I was uh, sometimes I'm still afraid of uh, uh, taking photos of people and so on. Do you have any suggestions for people to help them overcome their fears in this respect? Sure, sure. I mean, I think that, you know, as a street photographer, you want to label yourself that travel photographer. I mean, it's exciting to go to a place and capture um, in your, your set of pictures sort of the essence of your experience there. And of course, usually we can't deny there are people involved. And to have a subset of portraits or candid portraits can be really uh, uh, powerful to add to your um, the work that you're going to communicate when you show your work when you're back home or wherever. Um, so I think it's a good idea to take portraits. And for me, um, I'm a shy person at heart. And, you know, like you, it's never easy, but it gets easier. And I go up to, I will find someone who I think, wow, that person, for whatever reason, I'm attracted to, maybe the scariest person or whomever. And I will go up and talk to them. I won't ask, can I take your picture? Because that's too easy, uh, yes, no, and no answer. I'll ask, can I take your picture? Or sorry, I will say, you know, can I speak with you a second? And, you know, people are a little skeptical, but I have an elevator pitch. I'm a photographer. I'm traveling. I come from wherever I'm coming from. And uh, this place is amazing. And I like to capture the people to bring back and show people back home. Do you, would you mind? I love your hat. Uh, I would love to take a, a shot. So, you know, a little bit of flattering, but it's all genuine and real. And if people are willing to listen to my pitch and then maybe agree, then I could have a fighting chance of getting a strong portrait. So if I have 33 seconds or two minutes and I'll try and you know push it and, and, and I will take the person, I will bring them to the best spot, maybe start right here. They don't know what to do, you know, but eventually, you know, that first picture is just the breaking the ice. And I'll ask them, okay, look away. If they're smiling, which is wonderful, I will say, let's do a serious photo because in my experience, everything changes when people get serious and can be a much more evocative photo. But ultimately in that brief encounter with a stranger, I'm looking for something spontaneous to happen. And sometimes it does, maybe one out of 20 times. And then you have a picture that's exciting, that makes you say, okay, this is gonna be part of the set. So within my street photography, I often have a subset of street portraits that I do. And sometimes they become kind of the anchor of the work in that particular sort of street project. 
Um, but it's it's great. And the other sort of um, benefit, of course, is you have these experiences. You meet people, local people. Um, even if you don't speak the language, you know, there's that universal language of smiles and camera and pointing. Um, and in my own experience, it's become the most exciting part of photography, even for a shy person, getting out of my comfort zone, feeling that I'm able to sort of engage and communicate and taking back that trophy of an image that I love um, is very exciting and part of the whole joy of street photography. Candid or posed? Which one do you most, which one do you prefer? I much prefer candid. I, I definitely prefer candid because, you know, again, Cartier-Bresson has said that, you know, people react differently when they know the a camera's, you know, in front of them. Um, but that being said, you know, the candid is sort of as close to sort of real as you're going to get. Um, so I'll always try and sort of get the candid. Better to beg forgiveness than ask permission, generally speaking. But I say to some people who are having difficulty with that, um, you can go into a situation, introduce yourself. I'm a photographer, and you know I will say to workshop people, as we will in Milan, um, you know, use me as an excuse. You know, my stupid teacher has asked me to do these portraits. Would you help me out? And whatever it takes to sort of engage and get the picture happening. Um, and once you have permission, then you can relax, and then. In my own experience, it doesn't take long for the person to just, you know, be real and, and, and authentic. And even though it's not a candid image per se that you just encountered, it was a situation that was candid at one time. You, you then introduced yourself and you're able to get permission and you still got a real candid image. So I think it's a bit of a misnomer to sort of separate the two. I think when you work with a wide angle lens, Often you're there, even though people might ignore you, but they still know you're there. If you have permission to be there, all the better. Then you can relax, you can move in closer, you can do the things that are going to yield the strongest photos. The other thing is working the scene. Whenever there's a chance like this taxi woman in Cuba, I mean, she didn't even, she must have seen me, but she didn't look, we never talked. And she seemed to be okay with it. And so I just kept taking pictures. Um, I always want to kind of work the situation because in my own experience, the pictures get better by working the situation. That's the other thing that I think we'll be focusing on is to get people to shoot a little bit more and extend those situations um, because you end up getting stronger images. This image at night in Lisbon, I love the nightlight. It's very, very evocative and exciting to me. It's a whole new set of pictures. The beauty of the street you go is that it, it's 24 seven. The neon light is always glowing open. There's always going to be a different, potentially great image wherever you are at any given time. You know, you can do a whole project 3 a.m. Every image was shot at 3 a.m. That would be an exciting project. I would like to see it. Maybe you can do that, uh, you go in Milan. Because you're <laughs> an insomniac, right? Excuse me? You're an insomniac. I kind of know, yeah, I'm a night owl. <laughs> Um, let me, uh, first of all, I would invite everyone, I see the chat here is a bit quiet, so if people, listeners have any questions, just type them in the chat, be uh, glad to answer as many as we can. I'm just going to um, present uh, to, to you, uh, Steve, one that we got via email from John, uh, sure. and is very much related to what we were talking about. Um, and it is, do you ask permission before you take someone's photo? And I think you already uh, answered about this, uh, answered this question. But he, John, next uh, asks, uh, do you ever give someone money for taking their photo? Yeah. Um, you know, I have this kind of rule. And I think because I came, you know, I was a photojournalist, a good part of my life. And I think that once money is involved, it changes the relationship from sort of subject photographer to kind of model photographer. So the short answer is, um, yes, I will give money, but it's kind of how I give it. And so let me explain. If I see a street performer, um, I might, if I think, oh, this, pic this, this situation and this performer is worth shooting, I will go up to the performer you know, with my camera, and instead of maybe a dollar, I might give $5. You know, I'm going to invest in this situation. I'm going to make it known that I'm giving this. Or if I have time to talk to them, I can say I'm a photographer and so on. You know, I'm going to contribute, but do you mind if I take a bunch of shots because I want to, you know, do this? Um, 
And in those situations, those people make their, their living, um, um, uh, you know, from tips. So of course I'll do that. Um, you know, in my experience, uh, uh, traveling, of course, it depends on the situation. But, you know, I've sadly seen, because I've been to Havana so many times, I've seen kids rightfully and smartfully go to tourists and say, you know, if you're going to take my picture, give me some money. And I, I understand it completely, and it's probably very fair. But for me, the sort of natural human situation um, is the experience of shooting. And, you know, I might tip at the end or I might buy something from the vendor. But if someone specifically asks for money, generally I'm going to walk the other way and look in a different direction. Because in my experience, um, that's usually on the beaten path where there's a lot of tourists. And that's often not where I want to be. So um, there's plenty of photo opportunities without having to spend money. It's not that, you know, I don't want to give the money and help people out, but I want to pick and choose. And I don't want to be in that situation where I'm paying someone to let me photograph them. Yeah, and probably those people that get money for, for being photographed are the same people that have been photographed by a thousand other tourists or photographers. And if That's true. There's I mean, always somebody who's doing it for free and maybe has never been photographed before. Yeah. I mean, you know, when there's no money involved, the experience, I think, is a little bit pure in the sense. Now, it, again, it depends on the situation. I mean, you know, when you go to a country that's very poor, you kind of understand that you're getting something out of this. Why shouldn't they? And, you know, it's never an easy situation. I think that's part of the, the challenge of the street is there are so many forces and factors that are happening. Um, photography is just one of them, but it's really kind of living in a situation, immersing yourself in a situation, and kind of bungee jumping into situations when you click that shutter, there's a little bit of uncertainty. You don't know what's going to happen. But I will tell everybody listening that I've been doing this a very long time, and I can count on you know two hands the sort of negative experiences that I've had. And we're talking hundreds of thousands of, of experiences. You know, The vast majority of them are positive. Uh, I'm more passionate than I've ever been. I mean, it's 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 an amazing thing, and you can keep moving forward with your work and keep improving, and that's the exciting part of it as well. Uh, we also have a question here from Lisa. Hi, Lisa. We know each other. Um, what's your view on getting a model release for street photography? Well, again, um, you know, it gets tricky. I mean, there are certain places where it's kind of illegal to be a street photographer, so there are ways around that. Um, I haven't been to Germany lately, but I understand they have one of the sort of uh, uh, strictest laws when it comes to street photography. Um, but and I've been to Dubai many times, and you know, it's it's everything is a little bit different. The only time you really need a model release um, is when you're going to use these images in, in a commercial way. Now, you could say that as an artist, I'm going to make a print and I'm going to have a show at the gallery here in Manhattan. I live in the gallery district. There's a gallery there. I could print that picture. I could put it on the wall. I could put it in a book. Um, and legally, in the United States, the courts have uh, ruled on the side of photographers. It's the artistic freedom. Um, even though it's a commercial endeavor and there's money exchange, it's still the artistic uh, freedom that overrules that. And the subject you know, doesn't have access to their own image. I understand that could sound unfair, but I mean, street photography is really a history and a, a record of our times at a specific time. And it's kind of important, uh, I think, for humanity to be able to have these images to see kind of what where the world was at at that particular time. And this isn't just the journalists that are you know full, going to the big stories. This is sort of the daily life to see what's really going on. So if you want to use these images in a commercial way, Yes, you can have a model release. There are iPad and iPhone apps that you can use that are maybe a little bit easier. But I will challenge you and, and say that, you know, if you're in a country, a poor country, um, you know, people are apt to sign. You know, if that model release ever, you know, came to scrutiny, maybe it's not going to hold up. Um, the, the thing is, I would say, don't let that keep you away from shooting in the street because you can use these images, you can put them up on your website, and you can print them, you can sell them, you can even put them in a book, depending where you live. I know people are all over the world, but um, it could be published in the United States and Canada and a lot of Western countries. So 
That's a long mm -hmm. answer to a short question. Uh, yeah, th there's some wiggle room, and sometimes it depends, depends on the country and so on. But yeah, I adopt yeah. the same approach as you do. Uh, and it's... Uh, I mean, I will tell kind you, of situations. I will say that I've gone, let's say, at Cuba again as an example. I've done a commercial job where uh, for Nikon, where I take images. And when I wanted people, I would, you know, get the people first, you know, photograph them. And at the end, I would ask them, would you sign a model release? Because I might use these pictures for a commercial endeavor. And I would actually pay them. I would give them money. And um, w during that assignment, no one asked for money. When I asked for their picture, no one asked for money. But I that was a little surprise. And I was giving them because I was getting paid. I was getting paid well. So I would give them money. OK. I would like to, to read another question from Kit. Uh, I think it's a very good, interesting question, and I don't see it asked a lot. So I'm just going to put it out there. Uh, Kid asks, uh, uh, how do you sort and call to the top keepers, the mm. top keeper images from when you go out and you shoot maybe hundreds? What's your editing process? Yeah. Well, I think that is, is probably um, one of the most important uh, things we do as photographers because and I think, Hugo, we see it in workshops all the time. I think depending where people are at in their photographic lives, they don't necessarily have the confidence that they're picking the right pictures. And I see it with students. Sometimes they'll choose images that, oh my God, why didn't you choose this one? Um, I think with experience, you're going to get better and more confident at it. But basically, I make sure I go through all my images and I basically, uh, I'll use photo mechanic as a quick way to cull because it's very fast. I find Lightroom to be a little bit too slow for my taste. I'm sort of reluctantly moving from aperture slowly uh, to, to Lightroom. And photo mechanic is a fast way to cull through images, particularly when you have a lot of them, as you often do on the street. So I'll go through everything, and I will tag the images that I think are keepers. And by that, they're sort of publishable, because as a professional photographer, I might do something with these images. So out of a thousand images, I might, you know, choose 248 publishable images. Then I'll take a break and then I'll go back in and I'll tag the ones that are two star, three star, which mm -hmm. are a little bit better than just the regular ones. Um, and then I'll take another little break. So I might have gone from like a thousand images to 248 uh, one star, 110 two stars and 74 three stars. And that's when the real work comes in. I will you know, look at the three star images, which I know are gonna be in my final selects. If there are images that are similar, um, I will often ask, what is the main star of this image? What is the main focus of this image? Is it that moment? Is it the, the person in the foreground? And then of the five images of that person, which do they look best? And I'll say, well, this one. And then I'll look at the five backgrounds, you know, the supporting actors and say, which, which is the best? Well, maybe it's that one. And then ultimately, I will make a, de a decision. It's often the main focus that, that, that has more weight in terms of me choosing that image. But I wouldn't delete anything, depending where you're at, because, you know, and also if you give it more time, so if you can come back to it later, you can be a little more objective. You know, I often say that when you take a picture, not only does the metadata stick to the picture, but there's that emotional metadata when you see the image that you can't strip yourself from, and it's affecting you as an editor. So it's always good when you cut down to sort of the last few to get a second opinion and see what people have to say. But this is one of the biggest challenges I think we all face, and particularly street photographers, Hugo, because we tend to shoot a lot more. Yeah, for me, the, the hardest part is when I maybe I've shot a sequence of pictures using rapid fire shooting, continuous shooting, and it's like four or five very similar ones. And I know that there's a keeper in there, but it takes me a long time to decide which one because they're just very similar, slightly different. The gesture is a little bit different in one or the other. So that, that's the hardest part for me. And yeah, there is no... Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I think, you no know, I... No I Having had a, or having used a, a D5 at 11 frames per second and sometime just being lazy and just using it that fast, um, that is a blessing and a curse, a blessing in the sense that you have all these potential moments. But the reality is that sometimes it doesn't really matter in the end because those moments are so close together 
that this moment and that moment are essentially the same moment and it's not going to make a difference. But there's going to be one image where one person went this way, one person went that way. That's one that's going to maybe be the one that's the keeper. Um, but you're right, it, it can be very difficult and that's when you need some help. If you came to me and go, oh, well, it's obvious to me it's this one because I'm distanced from it, I wasn't there. I'm just looking at what's there and I'm able to be more objective. Okay, uh, I see people here are shooting questions. Uh, we have questions from Tazzy Devil 1011, from okay. John, Brian, Bill, and so on. And I also wanted to, to ask you about what you call the rhythm of the place, which mm -hmm. I think is very interesting, and about the famous decisive moment. Yes. Uh, but looks like we don't have much, much time left. So, I, um, I mean, I can answer a couple of quickies, but yeah, I yeah, only have a just, few minutes left. Just a quick one, Zooms or Primes? Okay. Um, primes, because Prime forces you to move around. And in my experience, you know, you move, you click, you move, you click, you move, you click. You end up in a place that's very different than with a Zoom where you tend to stay in one place and then tweak the Zoom. You're not really moving around. You're not really changing all that much. If you're going to use a zoom, use it at one focal length, move in, and once you're there in the right spot, then tweak the framing with the zoom. Sometimes you can't get to a place, that's when a zoom is most helpful. Okay, I think we, we don't have much time left. Uh, just going to um, say that we are going to answer all those questions that are uh, just hanging there, plus the topics that I mentioned before and possibly others. Uh, because we decided to do uh, another webinar shortly, right after you come back from Cuba. So uh, everyone is invited to join us. Uh, this is going to be Thursday, December 13, and it's going to be uh, 12 noon in New York, where you are. It's going to be 6 p.m. where I'm here in Central Europe, or 5 p.m. in London. 10 a.m. San Francisco, Los Angeles, Pacific. Well, we will send out an email and with a little link. You can convert it to your own um, time zone, of course. It's just going to be one hour earlier than this one. So it's th next Thursday in two weeks, one hour earlier. And we're going to uh, address all of those questions and, uh, uh, and more. Uh, so this is the first announcement. The second thing I would like to talk about, right, Steve, is our... Uh, workshop that we are going to do uh, next spring. Uh, it's going to be in Milan, Italy, which is my home turf. Mm -hmm. So you're going to talk about the rhythm of the place to the people who want to come with us to the decisive, the decisive moment and what it means to do passionate street and urban photography. And I'm going to be the local expert. I'm going to lead the people to all of the best places that a city like Milan has to offer. And this will include, of course, a lot of photography, but of course, being in Italy, it'll be a lot of uh, good food, good wine for people who like drinking wine. Uh, we also do a little trip to Lake Como, and it's going to be uh, April 20 to 25, 2019. We still have a few spots available. So I'm just using my very high tech uh, way of announcing things with my <laughs> okay. oh, tours.ucphoto.me slash Milan. Just take a note. If you're interested, go there. Let us know you would like to join us there. Uh, it's going to be an amazing uh, experience. It's going to be a group of uh, 12 people. We're going to spend uh, six days on the streets of Milan. That's yeah, a big uh, part of it is going to be um, you know, the critique, because we'll be shooting and then we'll be looking at the photos and critiquing them. I think that's a, a big part of the learning experience as well. So that'll be kind of exciting to to do that and, uh, and you know, shoot, assess, shoot better, assess. And, you know, I often find by the end of the week, there's been kind of a bit of a metamorphosis with a lot of photographers, depending where they started from in terms of how they approach and what they're actually getting. So it's it's exciting. I'm very excited to be back in Milan. I was only there once, brief time, but it's a beautiful place, and and I'll I'm sure I'll remember some of it. And we're going to see a lot of new stuff. Yeah, and, there's a lot of new stuff. There's been a lot of development of new modern architecture there in the recent years. It's uh, it's changed quite a bit 
since the last time you were there, probably. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so I hear you have to go. Um, again, we'll be back on the same screens uh, in a couple of weeks, December 13th, Thursday, uh, 12 noon Eastern. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody that's out there. Um, Mom, if you're watching, good to see you. I will call you. And uh, hopefully we'll rejoin and, and speak to, we'll continue the conversation um, in a couple of weeks at the, the next webinar. And I invite everyone to send us uh, questions by email, comments, yeah. feedback, whatever will be sure, sure, happy. Sure. It will help us uh, make it this better. Maybe we'll do a third episode. Who knows? Yeah, if yeah. People, uh, are interested. All okay. right. So, I got to run. Uh, okay. Take care. Bye-bye. See you after Cuba. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So that's really all for today. Thanks everyone for watching. And as I said, uh, let's uh, let's keep in touch. Let's uh, uh, meet again on uh, on the same channel in a couple of weeks. Bye now. <laughs>